of commodities such as cocoa, rubber, and timber. It is the property of Odua Investment Company Limited, Ibadan, formerly known as Ilia Mwage, meaning House of Farmers. Nigerian Television Authority, formerly known as Nigerian Television, is the first television station in Africa inaugurated in 1977. It is partly Nigerian government owned and part of commercial broadcaster. It has the sculpture of Ori Oloku head on its wall. Ori Oloku is referred to as a head dug up in the late 19th century from the Oloku group and used in annual rites to honor Oloku Oloku, the goddess of the sea. The radio diffusion service was founded in 1933 by the British colonial government to allow the public to hear the British Broadcasting Corporation's foreign radio service broadcast in certain public locations over Lotus. In April 1950, the radio diffusion service became Nigeria Broadcasting Service NDS, which was reorganized into the Nigeria Broadcasting Corporation NBC on April 1, 1957, by an act of parliament. In 1962, the NBC expanded its stations into the north, where it was called Broadcasting Corporation of Northern Nigeria, BCNN. In 1978, NBC and BCNN merged to become the Federal Radio Corporation of Nigeria, FRCN. FRCN, Southwest Zonal Headquarters, located in Ibadan. Liberty Stadium was opened in 1960 and named Liberty Stadium in honor of Nigeria's independence. It was the central location of sports in the old western region of Nigeria. It was renamed Obafemi Awolowo Stadium in 2010 in honor of late chief Obafemi Awolowo, who was the serving premier of the western region at the time of independence. The University College Hospital is the first teaching hospital in Nigeria, commissioned on 20 November 1957. Ibadan is host to Nigeria's premier higher institution of learning, the University of Ibadan, established as a college of the University of London in 1948, and was later converted into an autonomous university in 1962. The National Archive. Cultural property forms an important documentary record of history, which is very important to the people whose identity it is related to. Integrity is the interest that arises from keeping a collection together in aid of academic research and documentation. The colonial period of Nigerian history ushered in Nigerian archives of British administration, some of which were salvaged from rot and decay by Kennedy K and kept in the record rooms provided for the purpose at the University of Ibadan. The Public Archives Act was enacted in 1957 and ushered in the post-colonial period. The National Archives moved to its own building within the University of Ibadan in 1950. The National Archives has branches in Kaduna, Enugu, Benin, and Shokoto. The ineffectiveness of the 1957 Act led to the enactment of the National Archives Decree No. 30 of 1992, which unfortunately does not make the archives an autonomous institution. Consequently, the department has been transferred from one ministry to another, leading to its head not necessarily being someone with archival knowledge needed to move the activities of the department forward. The importance of the archival institution to nation building and the development of the archives has not been prioritized by the Nigerian government. As such, the archives had been in a very deplorable state of decay owing to neglect and underfunding. During COVID-19 lockdown, the archives have been locked down, unlike the National Library, making it impossible to carry out research on how pandemics were handled during colonial administration. The way out of this predicament that the National Archives is facing is for the National Assembly to enact an archival legislation making the National Archives an autonomous institution headed by archivists. The memory of the World National Committee created in 2007 will also endeavor to recommend all historical archival records of Nigeria's existence for listing on the memory of the World Register. During the COVID-19 partial lockdown in the historic city of Ibadan, it is obvious that the town planning of the old areas of the ancient city did not make room for social distancing, which was possible in the urban part of the city. The internally generated revenue from students' excursions to the Bowers Towers, Liberty Stadium, and other heritage sites has been kept on hold due to the lockdown, thereby affecting the maintenance of the structures. The way forward, is for the definition of monuments in the national legislation, which is the National Commission of Museums and Monuments Act, which is benchmarked as being created before the year 1918 
to be changed or amended because this benchmark has made it impossible for significant structures to qualify for being declared as national monuments. Nigeria also needs to develop a legal framework and legislation that gives priority to historic heritage. The legal framework must be such that harmonizes the World Heritage Convention with national law as well as traditional systems. Intangible heritage. Intangible heritage helps to enrich cultural diversity and human creativity. The expressions of intangible heritage give an insight into the worldviews of a community. Traditional craftsmanship is the fifth domain of intangible heritage found in 2003 UNESCO Convention. In this virtual tour, Agbedia Dodo will be used as the case study. Agbedia means blacksmith. The blacksmith compound in the ancient part of Ibadan city is at Bere. The blacksmiths in that compound are the descendants of the makers of the ammunition used for war by the warriors of Ibadan. In pre-colonial times, the men were recruited to fabricate weapons of war for the Ibadan warlords dating back to the days of the first Arela Tosha. The blacksmiths were forbidden to be farmers, therefore, they are the only ones who do not lay claim to having expanse of villages in which is known as the Ibadan less city area. Legend also has it that for them to be committed to the work of producing implements of war, most of them were eunuchs, forbidden to socialize with women. History has it that the men were extraordinarily strong because the trade demands a lot of strength. Children born of women outside the compound were brought into the compound to learn the blacksmith trade. The processes and knowledge of their trade are not documented in any form, but learned through observation and experience. Westernization and technological advancement greatly affected the trade as the influx of commercially produced farm implements from overseas became fashionable and preferable to the locally produced ones, while some implements are no longer needed due to Westernization. With COVID-19 lockdown, many of the members of the blacksmith compound who do not have the strength to carry on with the blacksmith trade have had to return home to the family compound because their other trades and vocations were not enjoying patronage. The way to preserve traditional craftsmanship is for the processes and knowledge of the trades to be safeguarded through documentation and digitization, which will be carried out as a social movement involving everyone and not just as a national project. The government must prioritize safeguarding intangible heritage by enacting a national legislation protecting intangible heritage, putting in place structures for safeguarding heritage at the community level, and ensuring adequate representation of the intangible heritage through the 2003 convention platform. Traditional knowledge is an aspect of intangible cultural heritage that falls within the fourth domain of the 2003 UNESCO convention, which refers to knowledge and practices concerning nature and the universe because traditional healers strongly believe that certain illnesses are tied to times and seasons, and also that some illnesses as a result of what we consume. Hence, the remedies lie in natural therapy. Traditional medicine is based on cultural and traditional values. Therefore, traditional healers are believed by their communities to represent the symbol of their health and prosperity. During the COVID-19 lockdown, a visit was made to the Aboke of Ibadan land and help sellers at the popular OJ market and body market in Ibadan. The visit revealed that COVID-19 affected their sales because the ban on air travel made it impossible for them to access their customers outside the country. The hub sellers, however, revealed that there was increased knowledge of the value of traditional herbs and using evidenced by more sales of immune boosters, such as black seed, parcel, lemongrass, guava leaf, and the lockdown led to loss of jobs. But the first sellers revealed that their children were put back on their state for sustenance during the lockdown. This point buttresses the idea that indigenous skill acquisition is important in this age of Western education and such for white collar jobs. It is interesting to note that the advocate of the Badon land is a retired civil servant and not an illiterate. We have come to the end of the talk. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for viewing.
Thank you. That is uh, the virtual presentation. Now I hand over to Mr. Tosin Bulabi. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I will be the host for this particular uh, joint discussion. Okay, so I will be starting with an introduction of the team NERD. Okay, just hold on, trying to share. So, Labi, can you hold your video, please? Is my video on? It's not on yet. Okay. For about now? Yeah, that's okay now. Okay, thank you. Okay, so Team Ned. Team Nerd, uh, Team Nerd is uh, a registered uh, company and we are registered as a Nerd Multi Concept Limited. We are social, we are, uh, we are a group of social entrepreneurs. Uh, we run the social enterprise for sustainable development goals. Okay, we, the, the, the social enterprise was founded in 2017. Okay, as a sustainable development goes at the center of our team. Our focus is on placing cultural heritage at the heart of attainment of the sustainable development goals. Basically, we are focusing on uh, SDG 1, 4, 5, 11, and 13, which are about uh, no poverty, that's poverty elevation or eradication of poverty. Uh, there is Four is quality education, gender equality, sustainable cities and communities. And uh, lastly, the SDG 13, which is climate action. And we are doing this through creative, human-centered, inclusive and equitable uh, approaches. Our mission is to promote cultural heritage in Nigeria and across Africa as a whole through inclusive, people-driven, evidence-based approaches relevant to sustainable uh, development. By the way, it is important to mention that we are registered with the Corporate Affairs Commission of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Our team, the team is made up of uh, four, uh, six member, it's a six member team. And of course we are still open for, to uh, bring in more members, okay? We are inter interdisciplinary in our discipline. We, have not, we are spread across nine different disciplines and uh, we are international in our working, okay? Uh, we have, first of all, uh, Mr. Clement ACN, who is based in the US. We have uh, Mary Aye Dugmont. Aye Dugmont, Mary Aye Dugmont is a lawyer. She's based in Nigeria. Uh, Olubusayo Hamawe, she is an IT specialist and she's based in Nigeria. Then we have architect Olufemi Adetunji. He is uh, an architect, of course, and he is a social researcher. Then we have uh, Mr. Yemi, okay, architect Yemi Oladu Joye. He is based in the UK, acted Olufemi Adetunji is based in Australia. And uh, lastly, um, architect Tosin Olabi, which is myself, I am based in Oman in the Middle East. Okay, so what are uh, our objectives? Our objective is to, first is to promote uh, best practices informed by evidence-based research in cultural heritage field in Nigeria and across Africa through education, training, and raising of awareness in uh, various communities, okay? Then the next one is to uh, advocate, to be advocates of cultural heritage as a crucial aspect of developing community resilience to climate change and disaster. 
also one of the objective is also to collaborate with governmental and non-governmental organizations in protection of cultural heritage and the environment. Okay, so I mentioned earlier, I said we are open to receiving new members, to welcoming new members. So if you want to contact us, maybe you wish to collaborate with us, you can send us an email to nedmulticoncept at gmail.com. Uh, we are currently developing our website and it will be opened in the first quarter of 2021. Lastly, okay, we also have a community called the Heritage Innovation Lab. We call it a community of action. Okay, we are open, we are, we are an open community, it's an open community rather, for passionate, energetic, and out of the box thinkers. We are leveraging uh, heritage, both tangible, intangible, movable, non-movable, cultural, and natural heritage for local actions in order to address the challenges facing human settlements, making progress in achieving uh, sustainable development goals. So if you are interested in joining or supporting this community, kindly subscribe to our YouTube channel at Heritage Innovation Lab, all right? And uh, you fill in the expression, the expression of interest form is in the link. When you go to YouTube, you'll find it in the link in the chat box on YouTube. So that is uh, briefly about uh, Team NED. That's a NED Multiconcept Limited. Thank you very much. Okay, the right now, the next thing we are going to do is we are going to invite our uh, next speaker who shall be speaking on the, on the topic climate change and its impact, Nigeria experience. Uh, Mr. Or architect Yemi Ola Dujoye, architect Yemi Ola Dujoye. So let me give us a, a brief profile of our panelist, our speaker for this very moment. Mr. Or architect Yemi Ola Dujoye is an academic and uh, academic researcher with a background in architecture and construction project management. Currently is a visiting lecturer at the Birmingham City University, UK and an associate tutor, University College of Estate Management, Reading UK, where he lectures on models such as uh, risk management with special interest in sustainable drainage systems. He is a peer reviewer for the International Journal for Building Pathology and Adaptation. He is a leading, he, is, he has written various academic papers and presented in various conferences, workshops, et cetera. He is, he is at different membership level of various professional bodies, such as the Association of Researchers in Construction Management, UK, work, Water, Environment, and Community Communities, Birmingham City University, UK. He is also a registered member of the Nigerian Institute of Architects. Please let us make welcome uh, Mr. Architect Yemi Ola Dujoye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I, I would share my screen now. Um, okay. All right, so thank you for having me. Um, I've been asked to talk on climate change. Climate, sorry, um, just a minute. 
Uh, I've been told to talk on climate change and its impact, the Nigerian experience. Um, and as you know, it's been mentioned, my name is Yemi Oladinje. And um, yeah, so at the end of this uh, presentation, we would have been able to um, acquire some knowledge on climate change in Nigeria as it is now, um, biodiversity and ecosystem and um, the uh, flood risk management, which is one area I've had to work on in uh, recent times and most importantly, uh, sustainable drainage systems retrofit. Um, so I would just be speaking on each of the slides like catching the train so we are able to do what we have to do and not um, take too much time. So yes, uh, climate change. Um, yes, ev everyone talks about climate change here and there. Lots of stories here and there. Some people will still tell you it's not real, it's not happening. And while, yes, now it looks like we are feeling the effect greatly in diverse ways. And it's not just within Nigeria, it's global. So um, you discover that um, what we are talking about now is of interest to a lot of researchers here and there. And um, this has affected, and especially Nigeria in terms of food security, uh, flooding events uh, keeps rising. Um, some of the experiences in different locations in Nigeria, places we've never really uh, thought of in years that would ever experience uh, flood events and also a damage to ecosystem among other things. And unfortunately, our political structure, our planning policies, uh, they are not helping really. Um, no one to enforce these things. Our policy makers are not able to meet up with the requirements of uh, uh, putting the right policies on ground and, and, and making it work. Um, our political system is more like PDP gets there today, they get their things done, APC gets there, they wipe it out. So it becomes like um, a very difficult task. Now, it's had lots of impacts in different locations in Nigeria. Um, I don't know if you would have ever thought about it uh, if I remember uh, when I was much younger, uh, I lived at different places within the Southwest and you discover that you get to some places and uh, you're, during, sorry, during um, Amatan, you would expect that the weather should be cold. But nowadays it's really, it's always very hot. Even when rain falls, it looks like a lot of um, the condition is not bearable for a lot of people. So it's like, yes, global warming is really uh, real, it's happening. Biodiversity and uh, ecosystem is being affected. Lives and animals are, are, are going into extinction. And um, there, there, there's a rising free, um, extreme weather condition around, like I said earlier. So it's there, the impact is very ev evident in, um, in Nigeria. You discover that what you experience in a place like Lagos is quite different from what you experience in a place like, let's say the closest place, Ibadan and, and thereabout. So what exactly is uh, adding up to this? What's, what's causing it? And, um, most importantly is the impact of uh, human activities. Um, the growing population, people move from uh, less urban areas, I mean, the rural or the suburban areas to urban areas, and they want to build. 
So you discover that most of those who are building, they actually uh, establish uh, impermeable surfaces, which would make it difficult for the flow of, let's say, water, uh, surface water rather. And again, you talk about um, the, the uh, surfaces which would require the felling of trees and uh, depleting of a lot of things on ground. So it's actually some of these human activities that is adding up to affect many of these, um, the, the climate change thing we are talking about. Again, the uh, negligence and failure to tackle the issues of climate change. Um, when successive governments have not really seen it as a priority. Um, we know that what they say all the time is there's no money, there's no money. So it's not a priority to them. Uh, policymakers, I said it earlier on, have, have, have not been effective in the drive for change. Um, there is the continuous glass, gas flaring, um, the use of uh, generating sets. And you know, I, I was going to mention or talk about this use of generating sets. Um, I remember in my house in Nigeria, we had two generating sets because my daughter would not sleep in a very hot environment. So we have one for the day and one for the night. So you, you, you'll be surprised that that is what some people are doing and that's what they are facing. So um, I would talk more on biodiversity and ecosystems and also talk on flood risk management to drive on my point here. Um, biodiversity, yes, I mentioned it earlier, making a lot of um, animals or uh, forests are being depleted. Um, unfortunately, the Nigerian government, they pay little or no attention to this, to maintain this forest, to maintain this location. So, Yes, we keep experiencing a major um, a negative effect from these locations. Um, now, the, the threat to biodiversity and ecosystem, um, when we talk about the high population growth in, in Nigeria, we keep growing more and more. Um, and the population would definitely need ab habitats. They would, they would want to migrate from one location to the other. And this would also have some effect. Again, unfortunately, our planning uh, policies and those enacting the policies are not being very effective. Uh, everyone wants to cut corners and they, they don't want to go by what is expected of them to do. Many of the forests are converted to personal properties and so on. So the effect of climate change is actually um, really eminent within our environment. Now I would here talk about flood risk management in Nigeria and I've just shared this picture of uh, somewhere at Lekki in Lagos. And this is just one of the examples of many other places. I remember um, something related to this at, I think, VI, where some people had to be using Keno uh, in, in, uh, when their location was flooded. And you go to some homes now that are not really um, accommodating because of, um, uh, because of uh, flooding events within their location. So little or nothing is being done about this. Um, government, the government will tell you, oh, we are working on it, we are doing something. The goal to visit and nothing is done. So it keeps happening. The drainage system is terrible. The current drainage system is not even working well. I mean, it's not serving the right purpose. And um, um, I've, I've been doing this research on sustainable drainage systems, which I'll talk about now. Um, to a large extent, uh, we, we, we've not taken up some of these initiatives because the, we probably don't know some of these things, but the sustainable drainage systems would use natural materials to, um, to solve 
surface water issues, surface water problems. And some of these uh, pictures I've shown here, are places I have visited uh, and I've used for my research, they actually add up to the landscape, they enhance the la landscape, and they've got some real benefits, which also adds up to a kind of uh, an advantage into um, uh, managing climate change within any location. So it's important that the Nigerian government is able to see things like this and they are able to um, take the initiative, support the system to make things like this work. This, this other slide is uh, the retrofit, which I've really focused on, which is a replacement. When you, when you say it, it's a retrofit, you are replacing or augmenting existing drainage systems. So it's used within existing properties. So in a place where you have uh, the traditional drainage system, which is really not working, you could introduce this sort of system whereby um, surface water is cleaned. It helps to control pollution. Uh, it's, it adds up um, in terms of aesthetics and, and so on. So now, what are the benefits? And I will just highlight just a few. Of, well, I've, I've listed a few of them anyway, but I'll just talk on one or two of them, which uh, one is environmental aesthetics and economic growth. So you see people would feel, oh, this location looks so beautiful because of the installation of salt, and they come around to visit because they think, yeah, this, this is good. Um, it's good for recreation. And then uh, people, um, some businesses are set up and they, they are able to um, sell and buy. So it helps the economy of the location. Um, again, it reduces the cost of infrastructure to a large extent, but I will not be able to dwell on that to explain all this. But um, it's, that's, what, that's one thing it does. Again, it mitigates um, its island effect. So when you talk about global warming everywhere is so hot and inconducive, incon yes, we, salt is able to deal with that. So it helps with uh, all these effects of climate change. So these are things we can come up with within the Nigerian system to deal with climate change within our environment. So what, what, what are we supposed to do really? We need more awareness uh, among the stakeholders. And it's good we have something like NED that would be able to um, drive initiatives, innovations, to be able to drive these projects within our community to help shape the system and to help um, put things in the right perspective. Again, our planning policies need to be revisited and enforced. Uh, people we put there should be the right, uh, the, the round hole in the, in the round, uh, well, sorry, the round peg in the round, round hole so that we, we get the, the right results from them. Policy makers uh, need to be more proactive and stop the whole concept of uh, it's all about their money, constituency projects and so on and not meeting up with what is expected of them. Um, and so again, most importantly, research needs to be encouraged in our tertiary institutions and private organizations. They collaborate with the government to bring up in, uh, concepts, innovations, projects that would be able to help uh, contribute into the system and help it form the requirements that is needed for the, uh, for, for, for the mitigation of uh, climate change effects on the population. So thank you so much. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Architect Yemi Ola Dujoye. Well, we appreciate that uh, brief and concise, uh, highly informative presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, one of the things I, I heard on to is the uh, mitigation of uh, urban heat island. It is really important because especially major uh, urban areas, 
they are is experiencing this uh, urban eater land effect. And uh, there's something we call the nature-based solution, which is part of what you mentioned, which uh, have been uh, suggested as a solution to you know, mitigate this uh, uh, urban eat island effect. So uh, please, uh, before we continue, I would like, I would like to say that uh, for everyone who has a question, please we'll take all questions uh, at the end of the session, okay, when we have the old sessions. So please pen down your questions or you can put your questions in the chat box on YouTube so we can uh, attend to them. Okay, so now we will call on the next uh, presenter, uh, Dr. Peter Elias. So I'm going to introduce Dr. Peter Elias. It will be, he will be talking about climate change, climate change adaptation and mitigation. So Dr. Peter Elias currently works at the Department of Geography and Planning, University of Lagos. He is a development geographer with specialization in regional planning and development. He does research in sustainable urbanization, envir environment and development. His current research projects include integrated deprived areas mapping system, networks with case studies in Accra, Lagos and Nairobi, to a methodological framework for urban data governance in Africa, Accra, Lagos, Lu Luanda and Maputo. Okay, so also he's currently working on city development and mobility services mapping for World Resources Institute, Washington, DC. Okay, so also he's working on green infrastructure for health promotion within informal neighborhoods in Lagos and Akure, Nigeria, among several other ongoing uh, eye impact project that is currently working on. Please let us make welcome Dr. Peter Elias. Dr. Peter. Yeah, good day everyone. And uh, thank you for inviting me. I hope I can share my screen. Yes, sir, you can share your screen, sir. So, um, I'm invited to speak on the title as shown on my screen, Climate Change Adaptation and uh, Mitigation in uh, Nigeria. And as I've been told, I'm uh, at the Department of Geography at the University of Lagos, where I'm a senior lecturer. I also lead a small group of uh, trans design researchers called the Lagos Urban Studies Group. Uh, you can see our information, contact information on the screen. I structure this uh, presentation as follows. I will talk about key facts about climate change in Nigeria in my introduction. Then I will look at climate change impacts, sectoral vulnerability to climate impacts, and uh, we'll look at some responses in terms of mitigation and adaptation strategies, as well as uh, make some including. Uh, I made some concluding uh, remarks. Well, um, the last speaker has talked about climate change, and uh, I just want to highlight a few things in terms of some of the elements that can help us in showing the reality of uh, climate change. Uh, 
if you are talking about rainfall, whether it's in terms of duration or intensities, over the last decades, we have experienced increases. And because of increases in the duration of rainfall, as well as intensities, large runoffs have become common experiences leading to flooding in many parts of Nigeria. Uh, 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 of course, colossal damages to lives and uh, properties. Um, yes, this rainfall uh, variability is still predicted to continue, you know, uh, to the near and far future. Preservation in southern areas also is expected to rise and with an average sea level rise being expected to increase, thus further aggravating the flooding uh, situation in the southern part of the country with the submergence of uh, several coastal areas. In contrast, droughts uh, which are more associated with the northern part of the country will become more constant and recurring. Um, and that, of course, is associated with decline in precipitation and rise in temperature. So why in the south we're having uh, intensities and uh, uh, increased intensities and duration of rainfall, in the north we have the opposite. There are a lot of studies that have shown the part of the is on the lake charge which is already shrinking at a very rapid uh, uh, rate. So temperature is rising and continue to rise very seriously. And uh, so there will be a lot of climate projections into the coming uh, decades. Here you can see some projections of uh, maximum daily temperatures across Nigeria using present uh, temperature relative to the climate change. And you will notice that, as we know, uh, the temperature is rising and decreasing uh, from the south northwards. And that will increase, will continue uh, until, I mean, further uh, decades from now. But uh, it's not just that temperature is rising, which as my last presenter mentioned, resulting in global warming. But there are also uh, implications for various ecological zones. As we may know, Nigeria is divided into uh, seven ecological zones. And the impacts or the, or the reality of the climate uh, change have uh, manifest in different uh, dimensions. For example, if you talk about temperature, within the mangrove zone, temperature is increasing. In the rainforest belt, temperature is increasing. Same thing with the tall grass, uh, savanna, and then the Sahara region. On the other hand, rainfall amounts is increasing only in mangrove and rainforest zones, while in the savanna and Sahel, we're having decrease in uh, uh, rainfall amount and the terms of rainfall variability report shows that in the mangrove zone, the rainforest zone, the savanna belt, uh, the variability uh, is, is uh, increasing and that uh, relates to uh, uh, duration of rainfall as well as intensity of rainfall. And um, of course, other manifestation of Climate change, in, uh, climate change in Nigeria are the uh, uh, rainfall extremes where you are having uh, delayed onset of rainfall and the rain, uh, the rain season, and also the, 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 the dryness of the area that are traditionally dry, leading to increasing droughts, which I've mentioned uh, before. While that is happening in the north, the west regions are becoming are experiencing serious storms. And these storms come with these short durations with heavy rainfall and then uh, leading to uh, impoundment of 
area of water in different areas, particularly in the coastal area. And we should also note that this have to do with the topography that we have in Nigeria, where uh, the most, uh, most of the areas are low line, and that leads to uh, the impact of sea level rise affecting uh, coastal areas in, the, in particular. Uh, so, to look at the climate change impacts in Nigeria, it is better understood when we look at various aspects of our uh, country. Uh, in terms of biodiversity, we are going to be witnessing increasing changes in the composition uh, of biodiversity, as well as forest uh, resources. It will also affect the extent that is the coverage of biodiversity and forest resources, their health co uh, condition, as well as productivity. That speaks to the ability to perform their uh, usual uh, functions. And then, in terms of water resources, there will be variability in water supply water quality, as well as water distribution. That will lead to a lot of conflict amongst settlements, uh, particularly cross-border kind of conflicts over water resources. We're all witnesses of what has been happening between headers and farmers over the uh, highly diminishing uh, resources, water and vegetation. The coastal Systems will be highly impacted in form of erosion, coastal erosion, inundations, changes in sunlight, uh, constraints of the water bodies, stresses on mangroves, marshes, and wetlands. And uh, these wetlands particularly play a very important role, but with the increasing impact of global warming and uh, attendant. Uh, consequences. We are losing our wetlands and also coupled with uh, anthropogenic activities, particularly in part of uh, urbanization, where many of the wetlands have been converted into uh, areas for development, whether for the residential uses or for industrial activities. And so this further uh, limits the capability of the wetlands to perform their traditional rules. And the air systems too will be seriously impacted with uh, particularly uh, already in Lagos, we are beginning to witness heat uh, waves, which have become a recurring decimal, and this will increase the incidence of infectious diseases, waterborne diseases, and uh, other kinds of uh, uh, health challenges. And of course, that will place a serious burden on health infrastructure and health costs. Majority of population in Nigeria depends on agriculture, and climate change will definitely impact agriculture in terms of the ability to predict crop yield. Farmers are increasingly facing very uh, uh, unpredictable uh, crop yield uh, patterns. As, and then irrigation demand is increasing, which is placing uh, a lot of burden on available revenue. And then there's also the risk of pest infestation associated with uh, the climate change. I told you at the beginning that the biodiversity's ability to carry certain functions will be highly impacted, and that relates to the ecosystem services that will drive from a natural environment. And that is further aggravated by the loss of habitat for natural, um, uh, I mean, natural habitat for uh, different species. Uh, and then uh, disappearance of uh, the species and even some protective uh, ecosystem leading to increasing migratory uh, shift. Climate change also uh, can, can, can be seen as it uh, affects uh, the land cover 
system, which is uh, getting more and more deteriorated. Uh, the exhibition of water availability, decision of catchment aquifers, aquifers, as well as um, uh, the challenge of regenerating our forest system. All of these are making erosion situation to become very uh, aggravated in different parts of the country, particularly in the southeast zone, where we have uh, very serious issues of erosion. In, uh, in terms of agriculture, we have uh, productivity decline already recorded, you know, and it increased up to 10 to 25 percent by 2018. And even some have predicted that it will get as high as 50 percent in areas of increasing rainfall variability. And that has implication for uh, livelihood systems of majority who depend on agriculture. I've talked about uh, water resources, and that uh, is going to uh, re reduce ability for us to be able to have access to uh, uh, groundwater resources, and that can lead to further uh, challenges. So, um, in terms of socioeconomic and socio-cultural uh, sectors, the impact of climate change in Nigeria are also visible in terms of the increase in demand for home appliances, such as air conditioners, refrigerator, and all that, which will increase the need for the uh, energy. And we all know that we are having serious challenge with our capacity to produce and distribute a, uh, a, suitable, a, a suitable amount of energy for our increasing population. Uh, there'll be more and more losses associated with mining activities with increase in uh, sea level rise. Uh, already in the Niger data alone, it will invest of over 20 billion will be under the threats from uh, sea level rise. A lot of industrial product, product, uh, activities, whether for food or drinks, uh, which are highly dependent on uh, 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 and uh, vulnerable to extreme weather conditions will be further impacted. Population and sentiments uh, will have uh, a lot of experiences ranging from strong winds, drought, tidal winds, which could lead to environmental migration as being witnessed in some part of the country. I've talked about the impact on health, human health, affecting respiratory systems, uh, causing the spread and transmission of vector borne diseases, and so on and so forth. Uh, I know that the focus of this webinar is around heritage and order, which are the bedrock of our tourist, uh, our tourism industry in Nigeria. So with climate change impacting tourist attraction and destination, you can imagine how that will affect employment, affect revenue in that industry. Translation will also be subjected to you know, a lot of uh, uh, vagaries as a result of climate change impact. What I'm talking about ports and coastal routes, or talking about uh, inland navigation, or even uh, maritime industry, all of this will be highly impacted. The educational systems will not be let out. We are having and witnessing more and more uh, increases in school closures and reduction in number of school going days for uh, those in that category. Now, what are the responses to climate change impacts? I'm going to talk about two parts, uh, the mitigation strategies, as well as uh, the adaptation uh, strategies. Because energy alone uh, constitutes a lot of uh, the contr uh, great uh, contributor to global warming and all of that, uh, I want to say that renewable and clean energy, including commercial agricultural, and municipal waste to burn energy and reduction, uh, reduction in dependence of fossil fuel is a good mitigation strategy. Not only that, government needs to provide incentives for investment in renewable energy sources. Nigeria is a tropical uh, country, and we have a lot of uh, sunlight which can be converted into uh, renewable energy sources. But that will, will, will need encouragement in form of incentives, and then also there must be innovative financing schemes that will reduce the cost of low carbon technologies for consumers. Uh, the solar energies, as we have today, are highly pro prohibitive. There's of course, so there must be a, a model 
that will make this uh, technology more affordable so that um, uh, 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 people at the lower rung of the uh, of the of the, of the economic, economic uh, uh, status can assess all of this. I also need to point out that we have in place a renewable energy master plan, which have been which was developed in 2006 and updated in 2011. For us to be able to address renewable energy in Nigeria, there must be full legal backing and implementation of this instrument. Otherwise, it will just remain as a mere document. What about public infrastructure and services? And my last speaker, the last speaker spoke a lot about that. So we need to uh, proactively and deliberately have a focused system of encouraging private sector partnership, proposal collection, and, and disposal of uh, domestic and industrial waste, as well as waste uh, reduction, among others. Forest reforestation, or afforestation is another uh, important mitigation strategies because of the ability of the forest to absorb uh, carbon. Uh, so there's need to uh, introduce aggressive uh, tree planting and reforestation uh, uh, strategies. Now, um, on adaptation, um, in the water resources components or sector, we have to think about floor, floor, uh, place zoning, uh, review levies and dam safety management, pricing, conservation, recycling, as well as the need to introduce desalination plants. Biodiversity, uh, uh, like we uh, have, have been seriously impacted by climate change, and there must be strategic and deliberate effort to manage our landscape by creating eco corridors, uh, like we have the green wall uh, in the northern part of the country. We have to think about policies and programs for fire protection, weak control management, and all that. The coastal system requires uh, barriers to soil water intrusion, increase in environmental flows, reduction in nutrient leaking flows, as well as reduction in other forms of stresses on the coastal environment. Agricultural system needs ad policy adjustment and, uh, 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 and um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, and the uh, farm practices, which will lead to change either in the crop production or even the entire agricultural uh, industry. The human segment and population um, also, uh, we need to think about how do we um, rejig our land use system, land use zoning practices, design standards. I'm happy that this team is highly populated with architects going to think about eco-friendly designs, building designs, use of solar powered household appliances to further um, help us in, uh, you know, uh, 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 helping our adaptation to the impact of climate change. Uh, in terms of tourism, we need to think of what we do to, um, you know, increase cool tropical resorts, to expand cooler resorts, as well as uh, encourage alternative industries or even uh, locating people where uh, necessary from those areas that are already uh, interesting. And of course, uh, in, uh, in the health sector, a number of uh, initiatives such as quarantining, eradication of uh, control, uh, window screening and medication are some of the additional strategies that uh, can be adopted. In conclusion, um, there, there's the documents put together by uh, the Federal Ministry of Environment in conjunction with a number of sister organizations called National Adaptation Strategy and Plan of Action on Climate Change for Nigeria. This document is a high level climate impact management policy and strategy for Nigeria. And it, uh, it proposes aggressive but needed and widely supported strategy in a national plan for national response to climate change in the, the country. It also emphasizes coordination and support for the multi-level and cross-sectoral adaptation responses. In addition, it adopts a multi-stakeholder approach which identifies rules and responsibilities of government at all levels involving all institutions in different sectors as well as individuals in different geographic areas, economic groups, so that we can have uh, a more robust adaptation strategies for the country. However, it must be noted that there's, a, there's still a yearning gap between the intentions as spelled out in this document as well as action plans, which are continuing to escalate climate change impacts in different areas, different sectors, and different uh, sentiment. 
Um, look, looking at the multi-dimensional nature and multi-sector uh, central nature of uh, uh, climate impact, the measures, the responses, and strategies also need to follow this uh, uh, pattern by uh, ensuring that ministry responses and responders are highly, you know, uh, they are working in synergy, whether at the national, at the regional. A local government level or community or private sector individual also and whatever it is that is a focus whether it's policy issue or it is uh, creating database for managing climate change, uh, adaptation and mitigation or it is for probability assessment or mapping or it is an education awareness campaign or l systems and all that the, the the role of different sectors as spent out in this uh, chart must be recognized so that we'll have an integrated approach to uh, addressing the challenge of climate change impact uh, in Nigeria. And also need to emphasize that uh, all of this will depend on capacity uh, of, uh, I mean, adaptive capacity of individuals, institutions, and organizations. And that's why there must be deliberate efforts to build uh, climate change adaptation capacities so that uh, that will uh, place everybody in a position to be able to do what he or she is expected to do and contribute towards addressing this uh, global challenge that has serious uh, local implications. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, sir. Dr. Peter Elias, thank you for that uh, awesome presentation. Thank you for the uh, information, the detailed information that you have presented to us on that uh, uh, topic, climate change, adaptation, and uh, mitigation. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, going forward, uh, uh, let me also say again that if you have any question, kindly put your question together. At the end of all the various uh, session, uh, we will take the questions together. Okay, uh, now we, we are gonna have our final uh, presentation, which will be given by Dr. Eugene Itwa. So I'm going to read out uh, the profile of our presenter. Okay, just a moment, please. Okay, Dr. Eugene Itua is the CEO of Natural Eco Capital, a sustainability consulting firm at the vanguard of promoting the integration of the emerging sustainability issues of secular economy, natural capital, low carbon development strategies with sustainable or green financing. Dr. Eugene is the thematic lead of Secular Economy of the Sustainability Policy Commission of Nigerian Economic Summit Group and our city organizer for the Secular Economy Club. He is a fellow of LEAD International. He is also a fellow of the Nigerian Environmental Society, where he serves as the current chairman of the Lagos chapter. Dr. Eugene was the chairman of the panel of experts that developed the climate change bill for the 8th National Assembly. As a member of College of Research Associates of the United Nations University, Institute for Natural Resources in Africa. He is on the roster of nat natural of experts of the UNFCCC for Nigeria Senior Policy Fellow of Institute of Green Growth Solutions and coordinator of Natural Eco Capital Membership of Climate Technology Center and network. He holds a doctoral degree in environmental management. Please let us make welcome Dr. 
Etwa, Eugene Etwa, for his presentation. Dr. Eugene. Yes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. And I also want to follow the cue to tell the organizers of the program, thank you very much for giving me the honor to be part of this uh, program, which for me, I consider to be a noble one. The, let me put my slide on slideshow. I'll be talking on uh, what you're already seeing here. I'll talk on policies. That is what I was told to speak on. And interestingly, I think um, my colleagues, the 12 they had actually uh, spoken some of the policies that we have available. The climate policy, how we can integrate this. Interestingly, uh, Dr. Dr. Elias spoke to this uh, aspect of uh, Lake Chad. Give me this as an example. In talking about the impact of climate change, here we as it's been said, climate change is transforming every aspect of our lives. Do you be social, economic? Or are we looking at the political dimension of what we're talking about today? And indeed, the environment itself with a degree of uncertainty. A number of uh, the postulations, a number of the suggestions, a number of the things that my kind is saying we will do. Our ideas put together to say yes, for us to be able to do this, to bring this down, bring the emission level, if we're able to do this and do that, yes. But of course, we still live in a world of uncertainty. So many protocols, conventions, treaties have been agreed on before now. Yes, why a number of them have taken us to some level of positive impact. We also know what had happened concerning other protocols and treaties. But in focusing on climate change and cultural heritage, We know that the weather pattern is primarily a threat that has impact on the tangible and intangible features of the heritage that we have. Directly and of course indirectly. How? We have said here, are we looking at the temperature changes themselves? Or could it be soil erosion, flooding, storms? You can even add to this. And of course, natural heritage through habitat changes. We know this generally impacts on what we are seeing on our heritage. No wonder it has become part of the things that must be given to if you look at development partners as part of their environmental and social safeguards, these are part of the issues that they have deliberately developed policies for, such that if they are supporting any project and there is a chance find, maybe they find something that has to do with culture, that job has to stop. And the needed protocol will be followed to ensure 
no damage to such site, to such uh, uh, heritage, artifact, or whatever it is that is defined. In, in addition, we know because of the impacts, population can migrate. And because population migrates, community breakups, abandonment of property, of course, with the eventual loss of rituals and cultural memory. Even the economic migration, without even looking at the aspects of induced, uh, migra uh, induced migration. You have some communities today where the, the indigenous had actually moved out a mass. All you see in such communities are graves everywhere. But the question is, if they move and even other uh, cultural advantages that the community had had, how will all of this be taken care of? No wonder we have this concern. As far as the conservation of cultural heritage is concerned, the abandonment raises a significant concern. And the concern it raises, how do we sustain traditional knowledge, traditional skills that are essential in ensuring proper management and indeed maintenance of these properties? We know we have had cases of defacing, we have had cases of uh, people uh, with reckless abandon, uh, taking some level of actions against some of these properties. And indeed, some people have deliberately brought down some of this, in addition to the climate-induced impact that we have talked about. Another concern is, and uh, Dr. Elias have talked about this, how do we ensure the important roles in economic development and growth through tourism and recreation industries, including urban and rural revitalization that cultural heritage provide? If we have abandoned all of this, how do we ensure that this, you have some sites that people before now were visiting tourists who want to go there. But because these things were not maintained, you discover that the traffic to, of people to those locations highly reduced. The income that should come to such community is reduced. A whole lot of things that are associated with this. So in other words, the induced negative impact could also be severe on the community itself. Indeed, there are challenges generally in managing our cultural heritage. The institutional framework, policies, laws, and regulations, to what extent have they given attention to this aspect that we're talking about, climate change? There's also the lack of knowledge about climate change vulnerability, even adaptation on uh, mitigation that uh, Dr. Elias talked about. The socioeconomic aspect, the lack of stakeholder motivation and willingness to act and literature appreciation of heritage. This we see everywhere. And you know some of these things that happened during the last uh, protest by ANSA uh, protesters. We need a number of this cultural heritage that we would have kept, maintained. Some of them were destroyed. The lack of funding for adaptation, planning and implementation of specific measures focusing on cultural heritage is also there. Now, for us to move and indeed make this set of grow, reduce the impact of climate change. The question is, do we have relevant policies that speak to this thing? Have we been able to inventorize or do an inventory and quantify all of the cultural heritage 
practices and indeed properties that we have in relation to climate risk. To what extent are the stakeholders, indeed all stakeholders, even policy makers and site managers are aware of climate risk in relation to cultural heritage. In other words, there is need to increase the understanding and of these issues. There is need to engage the community. There is even need to engage the scientists themselves and scholars on how more attention could be paid to the stress that cultural heritage sites are undergoing today. Why we see climate as posing risk, we also know is a force creates opportunities. So in this term, what could be the opportunity? Opportunity to evolve conservation policies that speak to this very issue, climate change and cultural heritage. Indeed, we want to see it as a critical factor in ensuring the effectiveness of climate resilience in and by all sectors, including the cultural heritage that we're talking about. So in other words, what are those opportunities? Is it possible for us to identify the risk associated with, we have highlighted some of them, or can we go further and actually do an inventory of this, quantify them, Then also look at the other side of it, the opportunities associated with all of this is very possible. Ladies and gentlemen, with regard to policies in Nigeria, I've listed a whole gamut of policies here. You have a national policy on climate change, you have the NDC and so on and so forth. We have all of this uh, national disaster response plan all of this speak to climate issues. We have all of this as well that you can see. A, a list of all that we have that speak to climate change. The question is, looking at all of this, do we have any one, any particular one that speaks to cultural heritage? I'm not too sure. Perhaps other stakeholders have seen this, but I have not. So if you have, please point me to that direction. We have the National Commission for Muslim and Monument Arts, CAP 242 of the Law of Federal Republic of Nigeria. The key focus is to manage the collection, document, documentation, conservation, and presentation of the national cultural property to the public for the purposes of education, enlightenment, and entertainment. Again, has this act taking climate issues in? I'm not too sure. Again, ladies and gentlemen, if you have been able to come across it, please point me to that direction. Already, there is a bill that, that has been developed. A bill was developed for the 8th Assembly on Climate Change, a framework bill. That's because of what the presidency had noticed, three factors, actually. I would not want to go into that. The, the, the president, uh, Buhari did not sign it during the, uh, his last administration. In this one, hopefully, we, 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 we do hope it will be signed in as a law. But suffice it to say that the National Assembly is working on this. I'm aware the Minister of Environment is also highly interested in this. So in other words, the relevant stakeholders are giving attention to this. And we do hope it will come out as a law to direct all that we're doing. Whatever it is that have been spoken about by, my, uh, by the previous speakers, 
they will be warehoused as, as part of this uh, 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 law when it does come into it. But then the question is, you and I are stakeholders in this now for the cultural heritage. What are we doing to see that cultural heritage is taken on board, is given attention? This, we want to see that we are able to do collectively and together. And that is why we need stakeholders like Icons to support in this. Already, I just want to bring to your attention that Icons is developing a roadmap. A roadmap that is based on the 1972 UNESCO recommendation concerning the protection at national level of the cultural and natural heritage. There is also a tax for that we set, set up now to define a plan to guide us in addressing the challenges linked to climate change and heritage in Nigeria. There's also the one linked to sustainable development goals. A, a task force or a committee has been put up to look at the intersection between the SDGs and cultural heritage in Nigeria. Another thing that we need to do, and indeed, which I commend this program for, is this awareness that we are creating today. Once again, need and co, congratulations and well done. We do hope you will strengthen what you have started and make it grow beyond this. And of course, ICOMOS has also done a couple of uh, programs in this year, for instance, responding to, to the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on Nigeria's heritage decolonizing uh, Nigeria's heritage policies, restitution, and other strategies. And then Nigeria's heritage, the past, present, and the future. Others are still coming. Ladies and gentlemen, without significant intervention, some of Nigeria's most important heritage will be lost as a result of the impact of climate change over the coming decades. To prevent this, requires your support as a stakeholder in this. We do hope you will support this. I have a, just a, a, an outline of uh, what I have recommended in addition to developing the bill, putting it into law. We will look at that bill to have taken into consideration cultural heritage. So you and I need to drive that to see that is part of it. We need to develop cultural heritage climate adaptation policy. Dr. Elias, and indeed our colleagues here, we can, let's see how we can speak to this with the Ministry of Environment. We need to de de develop the right policies. I just talked about one now that address climate change and cultural heritage. We need to improve knowledge about climate change and cultural heritage. We need to promote cooperation amongst us. We need to strengthen the public support for preservation and conservation. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to strengthen the stock taking of the Nigeria heritage that we have so that we can report on them effectively with climate change as part of it. Ladies and gentlemen, the past is essentially the key to the present platform into the future. This signifies the importance of the natural, the Nigeria's cultural heritage. It also serves as an instrument to effectively communicate climate change to the grassroots community, mostly impacted by, the climate, by climate change. Policy makers, site managers must work together. Needed action that are necessary to bring about this and laws that speak to climate change and cultural heritage. Of course, we want to work with ICOMOS Nigeria to strengthen all that we're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Eugene Etor for this uh, great and highly uh, high opening presentation. Thank you so much. We appreciate your effort in this regard. 
Um, okay, right about now, I would like to uh, invite uh, architect Olufemi Adetunji to coordinate the reflection, the question, and the feedback session. Architect Olufemi, over to you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And we like to appreciate all our presenters. Thank you for sharing your time, which is a voluntary uh, exercise. We really appreciate you. We appreciate your time. We appreciate your, your benevolence to share your knowledge with us. And uh, I would like to remind all our uh, presenters as well, our participants as well, that you can uh, share our questions on the on the YouTube chat, and this will be taken up from there. And as we move ahead, well, with the few questions I have here with me. I would like to uh, share, uh, share uh, ask them to our presenters directly. Uh, to uh, Mr. Architect Yemi Oladin uh, uh your, your presentation is very, very interesting and it opened us to, to the impact of flooding. As we've seen, that is a very predominant disaster risk that is affecting a lot of historic communities, especially in the southern part of Nigeria. And the question says that flooding is an issue in Nigeria for many years. We knew of, uh, if we could recall it, we know of the Ogopa flooding, we know a lot of flooding in Lake area, we know a lot of flooding in Ogun State. We remember a lot of flooding uh, in, in Niger State, in Kogi State. Now, what do you think we make the stakeholders to have? Yeah, yes. Sorry, I have been in a meeting. What? Mm. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Hello? Hello? Yeah. Yeah, I'm with Mr. Now, uh, sorry for that. Uh, 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 the question is uh, to Mr. Yemi now, architect Yemi now. The question is, what do you think we make the stakeholders in Nigeria to have, despite all the issues of uh, flooding that we've experienced in Nigeria? Architect uh, Yemiola, are you there? Yemi, are you there? Okay, let me move to the second question to Dr. Peter. Uh, the question is, uh, in Nigeria, is Nigeria really adapting with your uh, assessment of what is going on presently in Nigeria? That can you say Nigeria is adapting? They are doing the necessary things. They are putting the necessary things in place to ensure that we adapt to impact of climate change. Over to you, Dr. Peter. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> thank you uh, again. And uh, I also want to uh, express my delight in reconnecting with Dr. Itwa, a very good friend of our department and our institution. Uh, now, talking about Nigeria, whether we are adapting or not. I mentioned this uh, in my presentation that, and I'm also happy that Dr. Itwa rolled out a number of policies. Um, we 
in 2012 did a similar review of available. Are you hearing me? Yes, sir. We are hearing you, sir. Of available policies with regards to the natural environment with our project in the Southwest uh, Nigeria. And we realized that in terms of documents, policies, Nigeria has a rich collection of um, what to do. But the challenge is always connecting our intentions with actions. In most cases, like uh, Atemin pointed out, our actions are highly disconnected from policies. They are reactionary. They are not grounded in the policies that were set to guide those actions. So it is when there's hazard or disaster that we, we jump to do something, rolling out emergency uh, plans and all that. But we do not have a systematic way of dealing with all these things, whether in terms of uh, establishing mitigation strategies or even creating adaptation uh, options. So it's not as if nothing is being done, but they are not in a very systematic, structured, and manner. So they are often reactionary, so, uh, which uh, they may talk a lot about. Lagos in the the past regimes of a climate change summit, touching different as if there has been any climate change summit. So all the gains of the past decade between, I think, the time of uh, uh, Mr. Chinubu till uh, Fashola, everything, or even maybe uh, Amboli, everything, you know, eroded, uh, it's not up to Fashola, so that is the problem, the problem of continuity, the problem of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, sustainability, the problem of coordination, and the problem of integrating all these efforts. It's not, you don't uh, tackle climate change in a mere reactionary fashion, like uh, it has been mentioned. Especially like I mentioned, uh, you need to look at the various responders from the uh, global to national, to regional, to local government, also level individuals, and across the various sectors in a very integrated uh, manner. That's the only way we can address this thing holistically. So you saw that there are no efforts. It is the way we tackle or address this issue that are the problem. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for that uh, one, uh, impactful response. Really, a lot of things has to be done. Personally, I've conducted a policy review and I've seen that uh, even like policy, climate change policy in Nigeria is, I think it's, it's, it's stronger than some countries around the world. But the challenge is they have the system that has really put in, has wired the policy into, the, into, into, the, into how they run their country. But in Nigeria, the, the system is lacking and a lot of things are not being done. I would like to go back to you, uh, Architect Yemi. Your question says that we have a lot of experiences in the past about flooding and uh, that's resulted into loss of properties, loss of lives, a lot, a lot of things have been destroyed due to that. And uh, now the question is, what do you think if the impact of the flooding will not make the, the stakeholders to act, that what are the other things you think can make the stakeholders to act, to check if it's only flooding that we can address for now, let the stakeholders address it. Or what do you think they can move them to act to address the impact of flooding in Nigeria? Over to you, sir. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for that question. Um, I think um, recently when I saw some of, or when, when I started following some of the flooding events in Nigeria, I felt like, I think one thing 
which is really important here is we need to probably, because that's one thing I've noticed about Nigeria, we probably need to cut ourselves off this idea of waiting for um, the government, waiting for the stakeholders and so on to do some things for us, for it to be effective. Um, there was the flooding experience in the UK in 2007 that uh, made the uh, UK government to set up a committee and that committee suggested that they should, um, individual property owners should be encouraged to take up mitigating measures within their properties. And this is something we can also learn to do, that we are proactive in that individually. By taking up these measures, we, if we can identify these measures, um, yeah, again, it still goes back to the stakeholders, but if property owners that are also part of the stakeholders really can suggest these uh, points. Um, you, you talk of sustainable drainage systems, you talk of uh, natural uh, flood management systems and so on. You suggest these systems to the, um, probably the architects, the landscape architect or um, the, the whoever is involved in designing um, the, the, your property, then these people are able to give you what you have asked for. And that measure is able to help to deal with whatever you have within your property. Now, some other people will see what you have done and they want to learn from it. Because the truth is, in, with the Nigerian system at the moment, if you wait for the government, you wait for a group of people to make things work, it will take a very long time for it to really take effect. But when people see these things, they feel like, wow, this is wonderful. Can, can you? introduce me to this. And before you know what's happening, it starts taking effect within different locations and different properties. I hope that helps. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, to Dr. Eugene, uh, thank you very much, sir, for your wonderful presentation. It, uh, it, 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 it took out a lot of things. In fact, very charming thing, and we, we appreciate your effort. Uh, sir, uh, in, in Nigeria, in Nigerian space, in Nigeria context, we know that there are a lot of organi government organizations now that are, are involved in heritage management. We have the National Commission for Museum and Monument. We have the National Gallery of Art. We have the National Theater Management. We have the CBAC. We have Na NACO or NAICO. Like, um, like 10, they are about. And each of these organizations, they have their objective, they have their aim, and they are no much, uh, they don't really share ideas, they don't really work together like that, they don't really collaborate. Now, I now want to ask that this question is asking that do you think having something like uh, heritage advisory body? It's my, it's my, it might be a, a, a voluntary, voluntary coming together of representative of this organization with the NGOs that are involved in anything management in Nigeria. Do you think this could work as a way to create a platform to share information, to share ideas between these various organizations? What is your perspective, sir? You are muted, sir. You have said my perspective. My perspective is uh, it's a straightforward one. Yes. The question is all the stakeholders, key stakeholders you have listed, who amongst them is talking about climate change and cultural heritage? The, I'm not too sure if there's any, but of course, if you know any, let, do let us know so that we can all work together. The, if we have a platform to drive the, that aspect, there will be, this is a thematic issue that we should give up. So uh, that will be fine. Since they are the key stakeholders, they should even be the ones driving it. Why those of us, at the sideline, let me put it that way. 
we support them with the technical back, uh, backup. But I think that is, uh, we will encourage that uh, that be done. That would be very fine. Thank, thank you very much, sir. Swiftly we move to, uh, in the next 10 to 15 minutes, we'll be riding up. We understand that we are possibly above time. Please pardon us in the next, uh, I promise us the next 10 to 15 minutes will be rounding up. I want to quickly share my screen. Uh, so, sorry, Mr. Adetunji. Okay, sir. Hello. Yes, sir. We can have you now, sir. Our presenters are allowed to ask questions. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hello. Yes, sir. You can ask questions, sir. Hello. Hello, sir. Yeah. Yes, I said our presenters are allowed to ask questions. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, good day, Dr. Itwa. I I'm happy that um, a number of things have been happening under ICOMOS. I think myself a long time ago on the platform of ICOMOS, but I never knew that anything has been happening in Nigeria. So, um, and uh, the last time myself and yourself met at UN uh, Information Service, I'm not sure we spoke up to that point. So since this is a common um, space for some of us on this platform, what and how do you think we can uh, contribute uh, to growing ICOMOS? Because I think some of the things that have been mentioned, ICOMOS is a good platform if we can have a, Nigerian, a strong Nigerian chapter to address the intersection between climate change and the uh, heritage. So I don't know uh, how do those of us who are interested in ICOMOS uh, Participate. That's my question. Doctor Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Elias. Uh, good to reconnect again. And uh, thank you, you need for bringing us back uh, together. And uh, I guess uh, we should be able to speak after the program. I will private chat you with my and talk on how this can be done. But suffice it to say that I Kumas Nigeria, I actually became a member not too long ago, not too long ago, after we had met. Okay. In order to strengthen the, in order to strengthen the, 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 the I Kumas Nigeria, the ESCO, I'm not part of the ESCO, the ESCO in their own way, General House decided to set up different uh, tasks to focus on some of those things I talked about. Okay. The, like I said, I've already mentioned that. So I it to say that there's a task force on climate change and cultural heritage for which in their own wisdom, they said I should be the, you could be part of this. Okay. Others will be part of this so that we can use this platform to strengthen the platform that my the great moderator just asked just now. About. Yes. So let's uh, talk more about this. Of course, you can also access the, the, the website and get further information, whoever is interested in it. Okay. Thank you. Well, presently, I, presently I'm in Accra. But when I return by the weekend, I will, I will, yeah, I will confirm with that. You have your number, <laughs> so that, or if you don't mind. Yeah, I can send it to you now. To I will private chat you. I'll send it to you. Uh, uh, I, I should be able to send. Yeah. Your own answer. All right. Thanks. Thank you very much, sir, for that. In that Even you in your in, you. sorry in uh, in. Uh, his vow, uh, uh, you talked about, uh, did you talk about immobility? 
I think I, I don't know if you if you you if you have anything to do with such. I'm talking to everybody now, just to let you know that he free transport. With the, the idea is to see how free uh, buses can be introduced to Lagos. So if you are, if it's of interest to you, please, you can also contact me. Meanwhile, Dr. Lai already sent you my, my number in your private uh, private chatting you now. You can pick it up on this chat, Zoom link. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm really happy that this is one of the reasons why we have such this kind of platform. Uh, because it's a way to, it's a platform to network, it's a platform to, to, to collaborate. And Dr. Eugene and Dr. Peter, they really put us on that pedestal and we believe that we'll grow with it as we move ahead. And there's a comment that I need to pick up now, which from Bui Gaolong of him, it says, I think there's need for government agency to mainstream climate change into every sector of the government with set goals for achieving the objective. Brilliant presentation, Dr. Itwa. That is very right. In countries like Highland, in countries like Norway, in countries like Australia, in countries like United States, despite the, uh, the president denying climate change, this has been mainstreamed into each sector I can, uh, like an example, like this, the ICOMO General Assembly that ought to be hosted in Australia in 2020, that climate change was factored him into the running of the running of the General Assembly. They are talking about how to minimize waste, how to minimize emissions and stuff like that. These are things that Nigerian government need to encourage, need to ensure that this such things is factored into each sector, as uh, Mr. Long or Mr. Goye Galong has rightly mentioned. Uh, let me quickly go straight to the presentation without taking uh, without much ado, and uh, I'll be rounding up very soon. Now we appreciate the organizer that is a uh, uh, that is who we are, Heritage Innovation Lab, and as we say, anyone that if you are passionate, if you are if you are enthusiastic about heritage uh, uh please kindly join her platform it, we are it is free to join we, it is is an is a wide community that we are trying to grow and we appreciate the support uh of uh, nad uh, uh legacy 95 legacy 95 is a is a non-governmental uh, organization focusing on heritage management in nigeria they are based in lagos if you've not heard of jackel museum uh, let's visit Jack Museum. So it's a prime railway museum in Nigeria, as well as uh, Climate Heritage Network. Uh, we appreciate their support for this uh, for this presentation. Now at at NAD, I want to quickly intimate us with our interventions, what we've observed, and what we think, how we think, we, how we are moving forward to ensure that we create we generate impact. Now uh, the let me see. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Good. Uh, in at NAD, we observed we we undertook a a, uh, a a survey in 2017-2018, and the survey through the survey we understood three key gaps that are affecting uh, uh, leveraging heritage to address different uh, uh, issues, different challenges facing facing human environment in Nigeria. The first gap is lack of relevance of heritage. And with this, we are developing, uh, uh, developing Edureka. Edureka stands for education through innovation and rethinking in climate, culture, and arts. This is a lifelong and blended education approach that will offer a pathway to improving the, uh, the relevance of heritage to livelihood because we know that heritage is truly the ignition, ah, sorry, education is truly the ignition of positive change and growth. And this, uh, this action has been, is relevant to the national, uh, Nigeria, 
national economic uh, needs needs 2004, 2004 and vision 2020 which are the developmental uh, policies for nigeria as well as the eu agenda 2063 as well as the uh, transport the sustainable development goals that we have in nigeria the second gap that we've observed that we got from the findings is negligible engagement with heritage focused research conducted in Africa. Uh, we are starting with Nigeria. We observed that a lot of research has been conducted in heritage, but many of them are sitting either in thesis, either in uh, books, either in conferences, proceedings, either in journals. Uh, in, and we see that this is a way that. We are only talking within the expert. We are not talking with non-expert. We are not talking with the community. That is where we are develop. We, we are developing a, a code of this will be launched in the first quarter of 2021. We call it research to product, and we call it R to P for short. And this is an interdisciplinary approach to develop products from single or combination of research findings. Uh, conducted in on African heritage, uh, like uh, I'm start this this uh, this action is starting with my own research because in, I am conducting a research on social participation for climate change adaptation for cultural heritage, and I'm developing a learning game for this. We'll be unveiling this in the first quarter of next year. A learning game where people could, will be able to play this game. As they are playing this game, they understand the value of heritage. They understand the impact of climate change uh, that is that impact of climate that is affecting this heritage. They understand the mitigation, uh, the, the adaptation measures that needed to be put in place. They understand the economic aspect of adaptation. They understand the social aspect of adaptation and how the rest. This will be unveiled next year. Uh, all things being equal. The, the third gap is the slow paced or slow paced increase in conversation and engagement with climate change. Uh, this is this is the starting point. This is join the conversation 1.1 that we are doing, and uh, that is why we want to create a larger community where people from all walks of life, all around Africa, will come together, will, will, will engage in conver conversation, will, will create awareness. Not only talking alone, not only face to face, we do community meetings, we do social campaign, we do all the rest to ensure that we, we put climate change out there, that this is an exist existential problem affecting Nigeria, affecting Africa, and we need to address it head on with all resources we have. This is relevant, relevant to the needs, uh, relevant to AU Agenda 2063 as well as the sustainable development goals. Uh, what next? Uh, as, as I've said, this is uh, uh, what we are having presently now is JDC 1.1. The 1.2 of it is coming up, uh, is, is, it will be focusing on safeguarding African cultural heritage in changing climate. And we are, we are, we are, we'll be, we are currently talking with a lot of collaborators that will be coming up. ICOMOS Nigeria will be engaging with them because they have a key stakeholder in this. Uh, uh, there are a lot of organizations also that are interested to collaborate as well. And if there's any other organization that are interested to collaborate, kindly email us, we'll reach out to you, we'll deliberate and we'll find a way out to ensure that we, are, we safeguard cultural heritage, both in Nigeria and in Africa as a whole. Uh, this is the end for today. I would like to appreciate everyone that has participated in this uh, uh, participated in this uh, webinar. We appreciate architect Yemiola Dijue. We appreciate uh, Dr. Peter Elias, and we appreciate Dr. Eugene Ucha. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time, and we we we, we look forward to having more impact and more conversation like this in the nearest future. Thank you very much. I, I don't know if we can all put on our, our videos uh, and we'll have a clap to appreciate our, uh, uh, let us, we have, have a clap 
to appreciate all our presenters, to all our panelists today. Are we all ready? One, two, three, go. Thank you very much, sirs. God bless you and have a wonderful day.